there is no worse moment than putting on a heart rate strap in the winter. I have a three hour ride today. Instead of going on the normal uh, racetrack route that I, that I like for my three hours, I'm gonna try and go up a new climb that I found yesterday. I had a four hour ride yesterday. And you know one of those days where you basically just eat all your food in the first like hour and a half of your ride. That's what happened to me yesterday. And then I just sort of crept along for the remaining two and a half hours of my four hour ride. It was not overly pleasant, but you have those days sometimes. I saw a climb whilst I was out yesterday that I wanna go and check out and yeah, it should be around three hours to the top and then home. And when I get home, I want to talk bikes. Check out that pink limo just in the background there. Hey buddy! Definitely must have just been low on fuel yesterday because today I feel freaking amazing. The sun is out, there's no wind, it's nice and warm and the legs are good. It's all the broccoli being picked. Fields and fields of broccoli. the road I was looking for. I don't know if I'll have enough time to go to the top but I'm gonna go up a couple k's to see what it's like. It should be a really nice quiet road because from what I can see on the map it's just a dead end at the top which means minimal traffic. I'm amazed at how quickly you rack up climbing meters in this place. You never really feel like you're going up any epic climbs. I mean the BDOT climb is like 10 kilometers long but there's a lot of flat sections but I've done I've done an hour and a half Okay, I've done an hour and 40 minutes. I've only done 37 Ks because I have been climbing and I've racked up over a thousand meters of ascent already. Whereas in like Switzerland and France, you're constantly climbing and descending, but it's these big climbs where you're climbing for like 40, 50, 60 minutes. Whereas here it's like climb for 10, 15, descend, climb for five, descend. It's, it's a lot more rolling, but it definitely racks up. Should be turning around about now but I can see the top and this road is just too badass. I can't believe I've been here over a month and this is the first time I'm going up here. Love new roads. Made it to the top. What a climb. About 400 k's long, super smooth, nice corners, awesome gradient, stunning. What I wasn't expecting is that there's more tarmac over the top here, which means I probably could ride down, but I actually have no idea where it goes. Or maybe it just goes down into the village there and stops. And if I follow it and I go down and it stops, then my ride turns into like a four hour ride. But if it goes somewhere, then it's gonna be a sweet new loop. And I have zero data on my phone to actually check. I think I'm gonna go back the way I came and then I'll Strava this section and save it for another day. Home it is. If you get a three hour ride from your coach and you turn it into four, he doesn't get, he's not super stoked about that. I'm on the roof for my afternoon cup of tea. I checked on Strava and chatted to my housemate here. Apparently you can go over all the way down and it links you on to the main road 
down below, which would have made that loop really awesome, but probably a little short actually, because I didn't have to loop all the way back around and go back over the BDAR climb that I did. So that's a cool little shortcut to know for the future. I wanted to chat about bikes. If you were a long-term follower of my channel, you might have noticed last year that I raced on four different bikes. I started the season down in California on a bike brand called Prologue. I then raced the DeRosa in Canada for like six or eight weeks. I then was back on my giant TCR and then I rode the Gano Gen X A1 to finish the season. Of all those bikes, the only one that I actually own is the Giant TCR. The Giant was my team bike in France in 2014. The team had this prize money scheme whereby whatever money we won was then doubled by the team and then that was our prize purse for the year. And I used that money to then purchase the bike so that I had a bike to use in the winter. And since then, it's done two full race seasons, two full winters and probably like a half season of training when it's been used to, to fill the gaps. The bike came with Shimano 105 and after a season I upgraded that to Jura Ace and I'm still running the 10 speed group set on there now. I'm not the biggest fan of the Giant's compact geometry but what I will give that bike is that it is borderline bomb proof. I have raced two full seasons on it, I've done two full winters on it. I've crashed it, it's traveled miles and miles, there's like a borderline crack slash paint crack, not quite sure. On the top tube there's like chunks missing out of it from crashes, it's it's actually pretty pretty intense. The bike's probably done close on 50,000 kilometers and it's done some really hard yards and it's still going. But I do fear that it's reaching the end of its life. The metal sheet which is inside the bottom bracket where you then insert the bearings into is sort of slowly starting to pull out of the frame and I can start to see it being exposed on the end of the bottom bracket there and I've had the bearings repressed back in once and the metal sheet kind of went back in with it but again it's starting to slowly creep out so I'm not sure how much life the bike actually has left in it. I'm worried that if I try and take the bearings right out that the sheet will pull out with it and then that might be the end of the bike. So last year I got to race on three really nice bikes which weren't mine and there's a couple ways in which that works with teams. If you are a sort of top level world tour or pro conti team, bike brands will just give you bikes. They'll give you 100, potentially even 150 bikes for you to use throughout the year and to give to your riders and they might even let the riders keep them at the end of the year. I think that depends on the team. When you start getting down to the continental teams or the bigger amateur teams, it doesn't really work like that. So what often happens is a team will approach an importer or a bike manufacturer. They'll often reach an agreed on price per bike, which is usually cost price or maybe a little bit lower if the bike brand does, does want to help the team out a bit. And then the team will either purchase a whole lot of bikes for that price and give it to their riders to use for the season or they'll offer that discounted deal to the riders and the riders can put up the money and buy the bike outright and then it belongs to them. Last year I used bikes which belonged to the team. The Prologue belonged to the Velo Select team as did the DeRosa and then the Garno was the same thing with the lowest rates team in Rwanda. They owned the bikes and then at the end of the season you give them back and then they try to sell them to at least cover the cost of what they bought the bike for. So the brand doesn't lose any money, the team gets bikes and then they can usually sell them second hand at the end of the season for what they bought them for which means they don't make money but at least everyone sort of covers their costs. So that's kind of why I've only got my Giant even though I've been racing on other bikes. The Giant is the only bike that belongs to me and that's because I bought it from, from my team in 2014. So the reality of it is that although I got to race on some really cool bikes last year, the bike that I actually own and that I have to train on now is a three-year-old Giant TCR with 10 speed, probably with close to 50,000 Ks on the clock and is borderline about to die but fingers crossed that it gets me through the rest of the winter and lasts me until I get onto the next bike.